All right, let's get this started. Uh, today, in the main hall, your keynote speaker was speaking about reactive programming demystified, drink the Kool-Aid. Please give a warm welcome to Tracy Lee. Hi, everyone. How's it going? So, Gant, yeah, you forgot to tell everybody that I beat Ken Wheeler at wrestling, um, and I body slammed him yesterday. Um, true or false? I'm not really sure. But what is true is that Ken Wheeler was licking Gant's head the other last night. Probably like about three licks, right? So <laughs> later on, you guys can go to Kent, uh, Ken into doing that. <sighs> or Kent. No. But anyway, so welcome. Thank you so much for all being here. I'm so excited today. Um, and, you know, you guys might be thinking, like, why, why is there a reactive programming talk at a React conference? It kind of makes sense. Um, so hopefully this helps uh, you guys. Um, well, hopefully you guys will enjoy this talk. So how many of y'all suffer from JavaScript fatigue? Raise of hands. Anybody feel exhausted? Actually, not that many of you. You guys all love learning all the new technologies. Well, I feel like Twitter is very much this whole place where it's like, OK, replacing Redux with the new React Context API. Got to learn that now. Introducing Urkel. Got to learn that now. You know, uh, Bazel, the new Webpack. Oh my god. Uh, native Script and Vue, the new way to write your native applications with Vue. So I feel like this every single day. And you know, quite honestly, it's a little bit exhausting. I think technology is hard, right? I mean, you start off, and you know, one day it's flirting with you on Twitter, and you're thinking, yeah, this is going to be so awesome, so great. And then the next day, you're, you know, it's turned around, and it's left you for somebody else. Um, or you've left it for some other new technology. Um, so I like to sort of, you know, I have to have this mantra in my, in my own uh, mind saying, OK, stay positive. Be happy. That's the most important thing when it comes to technology. Work hard. Don't give up. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, be open to criticism and keep learning, because if you feel like you're the best at anything, then you're going to stop learning, right? And probably the most important for me is surrounding yourself with people that are genuine, happy, and warm. And I think that is one of the most critical things, at least for keeping me interested in technology, right? The people around me, which is why I love the JavaScript community in general. Um, so my name's Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter, at Lady Elite. I do quite a few things around the internet. So I'm a co-founder of a company called This.Media and This.Labs. On the media side, we do a lot of stuff related to just general JavaScript, trying to bring all the different frameworks and libraries together. Um, also, This.Labs, we do things like pairing as a service, uh, open source, support contracts, different things like that. Work with a lot of amazing core contributors of different frameworks and libraries. I'm also a Google developer expert for the web and Angular, uh, RxJS core team, and I lead the RxJS learning learning team. Um, and I love JavaScript. So if it's JavaScript, I've probably wanted to or want to play around with it. This is where my JavaScript fatigue, I think, comes, uh, comes in. You know, sometimes I'll have like five different applications and five different languages running on my computer at the same time. Um, I also do a lot of stuff for the community. So whether it's being a Google Women Tech Makers lead or, you know, doing a lot of events that, again, bring the JavaScript community together. So my idea of Kool-Aid and the Kool-Aid I decided to drink when I first started development was uh, reactive programming. So how many of you all have heard of this buzzword before? Raise of hands. I'm sure a lot of you guys are like, oh, yeah, my coworker is doing reactive programming. This is great. I need to know how to do reactive programming, right? How many of you all actually practice reactive programming? Any of you guys? Yeah, like if you're using MobX, probably. So a few of you all, you know. Um, and this is kind of why uh, you know, I have this talk, because I want to show you guys uh, what reactive programming actually is. Um, but you know, even in learning reactive programming or any uh, abstractions or you know, the paradigms around it, right, it can get a little bit exhausting. right? And this is this whole idea of, you know, I like to emphasize again, surround yourself with people who are happy and excited and passionate about what you're doing. right? Um, and I'm very, very lucky to do this because when I first started JavaScript, I started hanging out with Ben Lesh and Jay Phelps, who are co-authors of Redux Observable. How many of you all use uh, Redux Observable? Anybody? OK, like not that many hands. More people should do that. Um, and uh, you know, we would actually spend, like my weekends basically looked like this. Like, yeah, let's play, guys. Let's hang out and talk about RxJS. It's going to be so great. Um, and you know, thankfully, they get really excited about those things, too. So um, 
Let's talk about just what reactive programming is, actually, right? Again, when I first started, I thought, like, oh, all these guys are doing reactive programming, RxJS. This is so cool. This is so great. I must learn this thing. Um, and then when I really started getting into it, I was like, oh, that's, like, that's not a big deal. That's actually really easy. That's awesome. Um, so let's go ahead and demystify it a little and start with um, a few ideas. So I wanted to say, like, one thing is, you know, the ideas around reactive programming are actually very subjective, right? So um, this, is, this talk is really meant to get a few light bulbs going off in your head, really, and then you guys can, uh, like, hopefully it just encourages you guys to think reactively when you're actually coding. So the Wikipedia definition, um, it's a little bit long. I'll go through it. Reactive programming is a programming paradigm concerned with data streams and the propagation of change. Uh, this means that it becomes possible to express static or dynamic data streams with ease via the employed programming language, and that an inferred dependency within the associated execution model exists, which facilitates the automatic propagation of the change involved with the data flow. So that was really long, obviously. But in layman's terms, what it is is reactive programming is just dealing with sets of events over a period of time by the automatic propagation of change. So what you're doing is you're implicitly, not explicitly, propagating the data. And each step within your application doesn't actually know or care about what the previous step is, right? It just wants to perform an action on the inputs that are actually coming in. So if you look at Excel, for example, this is actually probably my favorite example. So if you see A, B, and C, right, D is actually going to concatenate A, B, and C. So it doesn't actually care what B maybe necessarily is. You can change this to reactive, for example, and uh, D will just implicitly know that, like, okay, you know, it's going to output I love reactive programming. So it's like the very basic fundamental idea of what reactive programming is. Um, one of the reasons why y'all should care is because what we've continued to see in the past few years is uh, reactive programming paradigms sort of being adopted and considered in different things, like uh, whether it's TC39 with promises or observable, whether it's WhatWig with the new event target obs uh, observable proposal, or whether it's different frameworks and libraries. And whether intentional or not, you see things in Vue, D3, uh, React, and Angular. So let's first go off with promises. So promises were introduced about 2014 to browsers, included in the ES 2015 spec. Um, and the reason why it's considered reactive is because it allows you to process a value um, asynchronously and in steps through then blocks, right? So if you look at the fetch API, for example, um, you can use this to fetch a JSON file. I'm chaining it together, uh, a few promises to parse a JSON file into a JavaScript object, and then console logging to sy signal that I've completed the parsing and I have fruit snacks. Um, so a lot of people, when they think about promises, don't actually think, hey, you know, this is reactive because the code you typically write to interact with this isn't necessarily reactive, right? But it doesn't mean that promises in itself are not. Um, if you look at the TC39 observable proposal as well, this was introduced in 2015, currently at stage one. It adds observable, it would add observable as a primitive, very much like promises were. Um, and this is also the most popular and well-known reactive programming paradigm. So if you look at RxJS 4 and 5, for example, you have over 8 million monthly downloads a month, and that number is growing. Um, in fact, RxJS 5 and above is a reference implementation to the TC39 observable proposal. So you can check that out on GitHub. Um, and then the WhatWig event target observable proposal just proposed a few months ago on behalf of Google by Ben Lesh. Um, and this, what this does is it's going to add a method called on to event target. So if you call the on method with an event type as argument, it's just going to give you back an observable of those events. And we can see that happening with this button right here. I'm going to get back um, an observable of click events, right? Uh, what's also unique about this proposal is it comes with a few different operators, a so map, filter, first, take, and tell. And um, this one, you know, we really are trying to get people more excited about it. So check out the uh, what way issue number 544 and comment if you're excited about this so we can, we can get it moving. Um, so let's talk about RxJS really quickly. There's a lot of different implementations of how you can uh, use reactive programming paradigms in your code. But one of the reasons why I love RxJS is because it's a domain-specific language for reacting to events that sits on top of JavaScript, right? It's also the most popular reactive programming li library, so you can uh, be rest assured that it's you know, pretty stable, not that many breaking changes, uh, life is good. Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I talked a little bit about, okay, where do we see it in different uh, standards? But then let's look at it in the different frameworks and libraries that we all know and love. So uh, one thing to remember, and one thing that sort of clicked for me, and I was like, oh, well, that's silly. Why is everyone so excited about reactive programming? It's just a term for everything we already do, right? It's just a term to quantify uh, a way of programming, right? We've just given it a name to sort of like the pattern of declaratively reacting to the propagation of change. So if we look at D3, for example, I think D3 is a really good example of reactive programming, but it not really actually being intentional, right? I don't think uh, the authors really set out to say, we're going to make this reactive. Um, this code example right here, it's, it's very declarative, right? Um, but that doesn't actually make it reactive. It's reactive because you're reacting to the propagation of change, right? And uh, you're, you're, you're not explicitly saying, uh, you know, this value is going to do X at this point in time, but um, you're, you know, it's, you're just describing what you want to happen, and then it just sort of happens under the hood. React as well. So let's look at React, of course, since we're at React Amsterdam. So um, calling set state in React, what it does is it triggers a re-render of that component and potentially its children. So this might be a little bit of a stretch. Um, and a lot of people say, no, this is completely untrue because it's pull-based, and that's the reason that they give. But this is actually false. So reactive programming does not need to be uh, push-based. It can be pull-based. Um, and so again, if you look at set state, how set state propagates change itself, the idea of it uh, in itself is technically reactive. Redux observable as well that I love, it, love is uh, this uses RxJS so that you can declaratively handle your business logic and side effects when you're using Redux. And then MobX, I'm really looking forward um, to Michelle's talk today. Um, but this is also a great example of something being pull-based but also reactive. And MobX is probably the most reactive example in here uh, in the React ecosystem because with MobX, your state basically becomes one giant reactive model. So uh, Angular, Angular, um, Angular has just fully embraced reactive programming. So RxJS is actually a first-class citizen in Angular. Um, and it allows, you to, allows them to do a lot of things. Like they have this on push change detection strategy, for example, that allows you to enable sort of like a more efficient and performant data flow because it'll push changes at you versus detecting changes. Um, they also created NGRX, which is just the Redux pattern re-implemented in RxJS. And there's a lot of other really cool things in the Angular ecosystem that, um, that maximize on this idea of reactive programming. Vue.js as well. So uh, if you look at the Vue.js watchers, um, how the Vue.js watchers let you transition state. This is Sarah Drasner's awesome example. Everything she does is always so beautiful. <laughs> so I love, I always love her examples. So then the question is, you know, we see this uh, in different frameworks and libraries, but um, where do we typically see reactive programming patterns, right? We typically see it when there's this very natural fit for events to be modeled as values over time. So whether it's WebSockets, user events, um, well, you know, whether it's voice to text, mouse movements, touch events, uh, animations, HTTP, et cetera, that's kind of where we tend to see these patterns. Um, so hopefully now that you guys have sort of seen where it exists in the ecosystem, right, you sort of drank the Kool-Aid and started thinking like, okay, so how do I actually start thinking reactively? Well, there's a few steps that you need to do. Like the first thing to do is just start changing your mental model to approach thinking reactively, right? And to be doing that, you sort of need to think of everything uh, modeled as an event within your application. Um, and also sort of changing your mind to say like, okay, all web apps are event driven if you don't already, right? And the idea that everything can be represented as a set of values over time, even events. So this last piece, right, everything can be represented as a set of values over time, even events, um, is something that people sort of um, have a hard time grasping and, and understanding. So the definition of a set is set in the math sense. And you know the current mindset when we code, a lot of people think like when an action happens, you get one value back. But the new mindset is the idea that you can treat events as sets of values. So an example is uh, an empty set would be a set, zero would be a set, one, two, three, of course, is a set. Um, and if you th start thinking of 
everything being represented as sets of values over time, then all of a sudden you can do so much more with your data, right? You can query it, you can map it, you can filter it, you can join and combine it in different ways. Um, you can give something half a set of things or thing, uh, a set of things with parameters, right? So uh, your application becomes a lot more interesting. Um, so hopefully that got you guys excited about drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, but basically, like, one of the reasons why I like RxJS is because it allows you to basically, you know, if you can Rx all the things, um, it really allows you to maximize the value of reactive programming within your applications. Um, so I'm going to walk through a, different, a few different uh, code examples. And um, in these, I am going to specify which framework that I'm uh, taking these code examples from. Um, but what I want you guys to realize and notice with these code examples is that you know, there's actually very little framework-specific code, right? And that's really cool because you know, I can take any application I write, and if I, if I have all my business logic in RxJS, I can literally just copy-paste most of it, which is awesome. Um, so let me first show you uh, how RxJS can help you by, um, so one, one of the great things about RxJS is that you can easily create complex interactions with very few lines of code. So a great example is just drag and drop, which is a hard problem to solve. And I'm going to do this um, in React with RxJS. So uh, this is my entire drag and drop example. Sorry if the code is a little bit small. Um, but with very few lines, I was able to implement something pretty difficult, right? So what I'm doing here, and this is also one of the reasons why I love uh, RxJS or reactive programming. Typically, it's very declarative in nature, right? So even if you don't understand or know RxJS, you can kind of reason about and like step through the code, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm allowing any mouse down on an element that has a class uh, with a plate on it to be draggable. And then anytime there's a mouse down, um, I allow it to move until there's actually a mouse up. And here's what my JSX looks like, in case you were curious. I love that fact that I was able to use emojis. Made my life so much better. Um, and then here's the drag and drop in action, right? So again, you can see I can just drag and drop different little things, and I can feed Grumpy Cat. And uh, she's very happy. So. Um, Another thing of how like sort of RxJS can help you is the idea of future proofing. So I know that's totally buzzwordy and everything like that. But I love the idea that just having an abstraction makes it so easy to change and add inputs into your application, right? And again, you know, the code that you typically see uh, with reactive programming is it's, it, it is sort of intrinsically declarative and really easy to reason about. So another example I'm going to give you guys is uh, being able to add inputs and chain them together with very little refactoring using Angular with RxJS. So uh, what I'm doing here is I've actually created two different observables. I've created cat food via drag. So you saw that I was able to drag and drop and like fe uh, feed the cat food, right? But in my application, I also have a little search bar and I have a little uh, uh, like C Sharp Web API thing going on. And um, I can actually feed the cat via a search, right? Um, so I'm filtering based on, with a cat food via drag, I'm filtering based on, you know, okay, am I dragging french fries or pizza or donuts or tacos? And then the cat food via search, basically any response that it returns, I'm filtering based on that as well. But because these two things are uh, giving me sort of like the same thing, right, I'm merging both these responses and saying, if either of these are true, then use the scan operator, which is um, an accumulator, and increment the count by one. So uh, you can see that here, right? So I can uh, type in hot dog and press submit, and then the, cat, the counter will increment, or I can feed the hot dog uh, to it through drag and drop, and then you know, at three, then you know, the cat wins. So <laughs> I mean, I need to make this game a little bit better, but it's a fun example for me anyways. <laughs> um, so uh, this is, I, I wanted to sort of share this because I actually really like this example and I, I really think this is very valuable because, you know, imagine if all of a sudden, you know, we're not using keyboards to type anymore, right? Like all those keyboard events that we have right now or all those, like, let's say click events, what are we going to do with them, right? Like how much code are we going to have to refactor so that our entire world is in VR or we can tr control our, um, we can control our computers with just the blink of an eye, right? So this is a code from another application I wrote. This is from a look ahead search application. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking three different inputs. So one input is using the Google Vision API. 
um, which is the Google Vision, observable right there. And then one is using the Web Speech API, which is the spoken keyword, so I can talk to my application and say, OK, uh, you know, banana or something like that. Or I can like, take a picture of a banana, and you know, it'll give me the same. Um, or, or I can type, for example, banana, and it'll be the same thing. And then I'm taking all those keywords, and then I'm merging them together. Right, um, and then based on uh, puns found, so based on whether I'm typing banana, I'm taking a picture of a banana, whether I'm saying banana, it's going to go to my server and like look up different puns uh, matching banana, like banana puns. Um, but you know, with this, I can very easily add another input. Right? Imagine if I just wanted to create a little VR thing, I could just add that little input right there, add it to uh, keywords, merge them all together, and then boom, done. Right? Like very little amount of free factor to add pretty difficult functionality to your code. Um, I, I've, I've been talking about creating observables a lot. So uh, taking a step back, creating observables is actually really easy. This is actually the most basic way to do it. So you just, you know, in the beginning, I was like, oh, I want to create observables. Like, how do you do that? It sounds so amazing. But the most basic way to do it is just use an observable constructor. You see that here. Um, and what we're doing here is we're just creating a new observable, giving it a function that gives us an observer back when we subscribe to that observable. And observers just have the methods next error and complete on them that allow you to emit values from your observable. Um, so this is actually a really good example. So this is the web speech API that I was showing in the, uh, the, the last little bits of code. And um, what I'm doing here is I'm wrapping the web speech API in the observable constructor. Um, and uh, with this particular API, which you can see with JavaScript, it's just returning an observable of arrays of strings to me. And uh, in the code, I highlighted it in red here. So you can see that, like, Wrap the web speech API, like create a little observable here, and then just merge it together, and then boom, all of a sudden you have another input within your application. Um, I did the same thing in React, and uh, like that's actually the next thing I want to talk about. So with RxJS, and if you are using something like RxJS, the reason why I think it's so important to learn is because you're no longer dependent on framework-specific code. Right for your application, um, and you know probably about 95% of your code can actually be shared across the different frameworks and libraries. So um, now remember, I told you guys to like pay attention to the code and see if you could see any Angular or React specific pieces. Probably more what you're seeing is you know JavaScript and TypeScript, right? But um, I want to emphasize again, like this is why I'm so excited about this, right? Because Again, if you just move all your business logic to RxJS, um, that means that your framework or library of choice just becomes your view layer. And maybe that's a little bit more familiar to us in React, but um, in other frameworks and libraries, it's so powerful. Um, so in fact, the Grumpy Cat app I wrote, I'm able to basically take that and you know, in less than 30 minutes, just sort of like copy paste 95% of the code and just dump it over into another framework or library, and then it just works. So I think that's really powerful and awesome. Um, there's also other dialects. So if you are um, working with different backend developers, RxJava, RxPHP, Rx.net, RxRuby, the list goes on and on and on and on. But I think it's really cool uh, to be able to have sort of similar terminology or language around um, across different, uh, different frameworks and different libraries and different languages. Um, so hopefully that helps you guys interact with Teams a little bit better. So a few of the different takeaways. So the whole idea, right? So reactive programming, again, very, very buzzwordy term. But um, what we've seen is we've seen reactive programming paradigms over the past few years being adopted in frameworks uh, and like uh, libraries and different standards in JavaScript. And the whole idea that no one actually invented reactive programming, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's something you have to learn, but it's actually just a paradigm. And we've just given it a name for uh, the pattern of declaratively reacting to the propagation of change. Um, and so to think reactively, right, one of the first things you need to do is really start uh, modeling everything as a set of values over time, even events within your application. And the idea that with an abstraction like RxJS, you can actually do a lot of things in your code with less code and very much, uh, very little refactoring over time. Um, so another thing. So I think when people learn RxJS, uh, Ben and I do Rx workshop, which is online and uh, in person. But you know, when people finally get 
like the hang of RxJS, they want to Rx all the things. Most people, once they get it, they're like, what am I not RxJSing? Like, what can I do more in my application? But you don't actually need to RxJS all the things, right? Like, you can start very easily by maybe, uh, you know, using it for a click handler or maybe using it for Ajax requests because RxJS allows really easy uh, cancellation, uh, anything async if you like, um, or you can just call subscribe and sort of do your normal imperative code as well. Um, so I love this quote from Benjamin Franklin, teach me, tell me and I forget, I always forget, teach me and I remember, right, or involve me and I learn. So in my journey of, uh, you know, just getting into JavaScript three years ago, having great friends around me, and being able to have the opportunity to actually get involved in the JavaScript world, um, I was very lucky to be able to start playing around with the RxJS docs. So I was like really frustrated with the docs. I'm like, I can't figure any of this out. I can't always have to call these guys to give me the answers. This is so annoying. So I decided, OK, we're going to revamp the docs. So you can go to rxjsdocs.com and see this beta site. Um, and you know, I think that uh, this, this idea of just getting involved in the community really allowed me to, um, to like retain and, and keep excited about a technology, right? But you guys can all do that as well. So if you're interested in getting more involved, this is actually a super simple application. Um, and you know the issues are really easy, but documenting operators and things like that is probably a really easy way to learn something like RxJS. Also, you get help from the community, right? Like if you're contributing back, people are going to contribute to you as well. Um, so you can check out the issues. This is where the repo is. Um, there's also a Slack channel. So uh, you can email me for an invite. This is also, the Slack channel is Reactive X. So, if you need help with, you know, Redux Observable as well, you can uh, always join that Slack channel and just email me an invite. Um, also, the importance of mentors. So, I wouldn't be able to do all the things that I love to do or be enabled by that without the amazing mentors I have in my life, which is why I love this dot labs because we have this sort of mentoring as a service type thing. Um, and special thanks to my talk mentors. So uh, Jay, Ben, L, Ashwin, and Dimitri really uh, helped walk through this talk with me and think about like, all right, you know, what are the exciting things that people will get excited about? I think sometimes when you're really close to technology, you forget that not everybody knows the things that you know, right? So uh, sometimes like a lot of these things that I take for granted, and I think that's with that with everybody, um, you forget that people don't know because they're not working in it every day, let's say. So stay in touch. Feel free to find me at Lady Elite. Come say hi, and thanks so much for listening. Thank you.